You're listening to Setting Course, an ABS podcast. Join us as we navigate the latest trends, developments, and challenges facing the rapidly evolving maritime and offshore industries. Catch every episode at www.eagle.org and podcast platforms everywhere. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm John Snyder, Managing Editor of Riviera Maritime Media, and I'll be your host. Joining me today to discuss nuclear power on setting course in ABS podcast are Patrick Ryan, Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer, and Meg Dowling, Technology Engineer at ABS. Patrick and Meg, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Happy to be here. Shipping's ambition to reach net zero emissions by or about 2050 is driving owners to consider alternative fuels and power sources. One of those is nuclear energy. With the the desire to reduce shipping CO2 uh, and uh, greenhouse gas emissions in line with the Paris Agreement, does uh, nuclear power really have a, have a part to play? Well, I think so, John. I think um, increasingly over the last year, two years, three years, the, the topic of nuclear energy has gotten louder and louder in the industry. Um, when we think about where it fits, my, my personal feeling is that we're going to see it used in the production of alternative fuels first. I think it reduces a lot of the questions about how nuclear ships that would be powered would trade between countries and, and ports internationally. And I think the idea that green fuels, whether they be ammonia or hydrogen, will be very competitive in a market beyond even marine. And so production will be um, very, very important. And I think the concept of offshore fuel production is what we will see first using nuclear power. I think, of course, when we think about nuclear energy, the idea that we could actually power ships seems apparent because we've been doing that for decades. And I think that will come as well. Um, but I think that will be a little bit of a, a longer tail. I'm, I'm coming from a research background and I've looked into hydrogen, I've looked into ammonia, biofuels. What are the implications these all have on board? But the big question remains in the spread of energy demand by 2050 and, and further, where are we actually getting the energy from to produce these fuels? Traditionally, they're produced with fossil fuels or renewable energy is an option, but it's intermittent and not as reliable. So, so we're seeing a growth in energy demand. And the only place I can see that potentially coming from is from the advanced nuclear technologies that are being discussed right now. Now, you mentioned advanced nuclear technologies uh, being discussed. And of course, um, uh, when you mention nuclear power, the, the, the first thing that leaps in the minds of, uh, of the general public really is things like Chernobyl and Fukushima. How has, has the technology changed, Meg? And, and you know, what about, um, you know, I'm hearing announcements about uh, molten salt reactors. How, how does that technology work? That's a big question. And let me premise that with the leading up to this entire conversation about addressing the public on this subject. Our nuclear engineering industry has grown from these incidents uh, and they're advancing technologies to never allow those incidents to happen again. And I'm not going to go into the detail of what happened or the case studies that we've heard of either in the incident, but it's difficult for me. And a lot of what I do is, is I'm listening from these brilliant nuclear engineers, these very, very smart marine engineers they're coming together and they're trying to communicate. And, and it's a translation. So what are we trying to say to the public to get them to be supportive of nuclear energy? And it's a step away from negative thoughts or what's the inherent thing we should say to support positive thoughts in, about nuclear power. So that's a lot of what I do. You know, do, what words do we use exactly? So the advanced technology, the second part of the question is, it, is, is building upon the conventional reactors we're t taking steps forward to be more inherently safe. A lot of the designs improve efficiency and performance. You know, they use fuel more effectively. And this is a part that a lot of people get more sensitive about in terms of using the right word. Is it nuclear waste or is it used fuel or is it another word? We want to step away from saying waste in general because that sounds hazardous. That sounds like it, we have no control over it. But actually, we have quite a lot of control over it. And some of it can be reusable. 
So there's a lot of benefits to the advanced reactor designs that we're seeing, differentiating by their moderators or their coolants. Molten salt's on in discussion right now because it can operate at uh, atmospheric or near atmospheric pressures, which means if there's a pressure incident, there's not a possibility of having a, a hazardous release of material. So that's one of the very inherent benefits of these, these reactors that can work at atmospheric or near atmospheric pressure. They do operate at very high temperatures. They're literally a molten solid that's circulating very naturally through the reactor to extract that heat energy. And, and I'll stop there for now. I could go on. Patrick, uh, and I want you both to answer uh, this kind of next um, round of questions I have for you. But Patrick, why don't you address this first? Uh, I was going to ask, you know, what are certainly some of the technical challenges of commercializing nuclear propulsion, for example, for for a merchant ship? Sure. Thanks, John. Yeah. It, it, I think when we think about the technical challenges, we think about the reactor. And I think, you know, Meg covered some of the, the interesting things going on in advancing those reactors. As a naval architect, I also like to think about the ship. And how does how does that work? Whether it's a, a floating power barge or offshore facility or a vessel, it may be a material for, for this part of the conversation. But the design workforce in the world working with this technology is doesn't have a lot of experience with it. And so using it for commercial practices will, will take a, a little bit of time for the marine industry to really start to understand the unique challenges. When I stop to, to really think about it, how will this be done at the huge scale that we need for the industry, I come back to, well, how are we going to produce or maybe manufacture is the right word, um, these type of, of modular, small modular reactors to support this large industry. So um, you think, you know, what's going on in the United States terrestrially focused on uh, replacing coal-fired power plants, and this is where small modular reactors have really gotten a foothold in the national dialogue. You're going to be competing against those kind of needs to use this in um, in our maritime industry as well. So supporting the production of the reactors will be something that will be a technical challenge, an economic challenge for the nation and the industry. And then I think as you you start to then extrapolate what's next, well, then it's going to be the shipyards. Well, which shipyards are going to be ready to handle this kind of technology? And then how are we going to move a small modular reactor from where it's manufactured into a, a into a production facility and, and perhaps um, maybe even transported internationally, depending on where the reactor is produced, vice where the ship is built. Uh, so lots of, lots of interesting technical challenges on the horizon for it. And I'd I'd love to hear Meg's perspective as well. Yeah, I think you touched upon the key points of this is something new. We have to transport a fuel or a partially fueled reactor from a place of fabrication rather than building it on site. Building it on site is expensive. It's unique. You need to take into account the physical location, the environment there. And we'll still do that for the marine units, but it's going into operation at a different stage than its fabrication. So that's captured in there. It's something entirely new where we're trying to translate stationary nuclear power to operate on a floating unit, which has been done historically, but we're trying to lean away and step away from the conventional historical ways we've used that. Um, There's a couple of examples Uh, But they're all either aged or government owned and operated. So if we want to do commercial nuclear application that's floating, we need to look at it from an entirely new perspective. A lot of that is, you know, how does a reactor operate under certain inclinations or accelerations due to wind and waves? How, How that floating unit is reacting to its environment? The reactor shouldn't be too affected by it, but we still need to incorporate these additional risks into its operational profile. And I'm very confident that the engineers, the nuclear engineers and marine engineers that are working on these are very capable of addressing those. There's incredible um, advancements in simulation as well, including inside the reactors and, and how the coolant is circulating and how all of its internal functions are working. And I think that that's easy to address. Some of the other issues are how do we regulate that and how do we get everyone trained and on board to operate these things? And that's a whole other, maybe it's not a technical issue, but it, there are many aspects to the challenge that we're addressing. And, and you know, John, if I, if I might, I just want to circle back around and follow up. I think the question of, you know, what are the challenges is a good one. But I think there's some really amazing opportunities for taking nuclear power into the maritime domain. The idea that you could decouple um, a seismic event from the reactor by having the water column in between because it's floating, right, should 
should be very interesting to talk about. Presence of a very large heat sink uh, of the sea, very interesting to talk about. And if you think about the earliest applications of nuclear power could be in the production of fuels, hydrogen or ammonia, using the feedstock of the sea to, to have your hydrogen and your oxygen available for electrolysis is another really amazing opportunity that sea-based nuclear power presents that, that perhaps uh, land-based does not. So I think when we talk about the challenges, that's the right thing to do. Uh, we're all engineers. We, we like to do that, uh, that type of, of discussion. But we should also keep in mind that there's amazing opportunities for these types of actions. Going back to the language discussion, what's the right word to use? I always like to replace the word challenges with opportunities. And it usually means the exact same thing. <laughs> Interesting, Patrick. I was going to say then, uh, you know, certainly nuclear power uh, for propulsion uh, is is one aspect, but you bring up a good point in, in regards to uh, protect, uh, perhaps uh, creating some uh, floating uh, e-fuels production uh, facilities and uh, and perhaps even uh, I've seen some concepts uh, in regards to uh, floating nuclear um, power barges uh, mm-hmm. that, that can uh, certainly assist uh, either as uh, in remote island locations uh, where power the power grid is down or perhaps uh, for uh, military applications as well sure and I think uh, you know even even goes further to say look at you know the majority of humanity lives close to the sea and land is a premium close to the sea and when you build terrestrial power plants you need a lot of space maybe less space for nuclear than other types of power plants but but nevertheless you still need to worry about that kind of land use and licensing. And I think using the sea offers a big opportunity, even if it's just a floaty power barge, uh, not meant to be moved around a lot. Um, but uh, there's, uh, like I say, there's uh, there's opportunity, as I guess as Meg says, mm-hmm. uh, opportunity yeah. for using floating nuclear power plants, um, even in, in densely populated areas. And the larger scale of marine decarbonization, we're seeing a lot of onshore power supply for our smaller ships. So even if you can't produce a giant nuclear ship, all of the tugs that handle it, the pilot boats, the smaller coastal vessels that need to be decarbonized. One of their strategies is to electrify absolutely everything in port, not only the ships, but the drayage trucks and the cargo handling. And if the nuclear reactor is just stationed offshore, it's certainly relaxing for the population of that city or that port to know that it's slightly farther away. It's safe from, for example, off the coast of California, it's going to be safer from earthquakes there and, and, and land-based hazards. So it brings a lot of peace of mind to the population that it's a little farther away, but it's still supporting the electrification and the, the overall greenhouse gas reduction efforts in those areas. Right. So something on the akin to uh, what we're seeing as far as uh, shoreside uh, uh, power charging, for example. That's right. Yes. Now, we, we touched on it a little bit, um, and um, uh, Patrick, you had highlighted, I guess, the, the skills needed at uh, uh, shipyards to uh, to build these vessels. And what about the skill requirements for our mariners? Uh, Meg, I guess maybe you want to tackle that one first? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of this discussion pop up. And what's the most pressing issue if we want to adopt some of these things? And a lot of the time, the public sees that as a training issue. Conventional nuclear reactors on ships is the Navy's. They're very stringently trained. Their primary focus is safety and operational reliability, which is excellent. Everyone wants that. Not everyone necessarily wants to pay for that, but we have to find a medium here. Where's the pool of resources, pool of talent that we want to draw from to power our future nuclear ships or to operate our future shipyards that are installing some of this? So we're thinking that we can draw from that pool of talent from um, cadets or from the Navy folks who want to leave the Navy service but want to re- remain in, in, in maritime service. They have the expertise needed. And we're also working with the nuclear industry to see where they're drawing their pool of talent from, which is, again, some of the Navy individuals, when they're done with the Navy, they'll go work in you know Idaho National Lab or the other nuclear commercial applications on land, they have that experience and that expertise. Yeah, I think I think what, what we'll end up seeing as small modular reactors kind of hit the scene is that it'll be more than one market, right? So as Meg kind of alludes to, we'll have land-based uses as well as, as maritime. I think we'll probably also start to see 
the emergence of some interesting business models in maritime, where perhaps the reactor aboard the vessel isn't owned by the vessel, it's or the vessel owner, it's, it's leased. And perhaps the crew that operates the reactor is part of the reactor company, kind of similar to what we see in aircraft engines even today, where a lot of them are not sold, they're licensed, and they're the providers, the OEMs are selling uptime um, rather than an aircraft engine. We might see similar corollaries in our own industry. I think that opportunity, you know, as as far as how do I understand the the talent that I need to bring into my shipping company, maybe it's not so much I have to worry about hiring nuclear qualified people. I have to license really great people from a nuclear power provider, and then they sail with my vessel. And another another thing is uh, the chief technologist. I guess I should would be remiss if I did not mention, you know, kind of what what is the future of automation? What is the future of computer control? Can we do things remotely? Can we do experts not on the vessel, but remotely supporting a crew? People say, oh my goodness, you're talking about that in nuclear at the same time. Yeah. Obviously, we'll have to demonstrate that probably in other areas first. Those things are coming, right? The ability for a vessel to communicate um, with high bandwidth at sea is upon us. It's happening with some of the amazing satellite communication networks that are in place today. Uh, we're seeing more and more of this with autonomous operations of very large ships. And uh, I'm not suggesting that they will, these vessels would be unmanned, but they will probably have a lot more sophisticated control and automation systems in the future than we think about even today. And I think that will go a fair, fair distance in helping the industry adapt to and adopt for and be ready for the skill requirements for America. I think there's something to be said as well about public relations that, that's going on in the press on this subject. In the last three, four years even, young people are seeing the drive for decarbonization. We're seeing a lot of publicity on that, uh, cleaning our environment and, and the world around us. And they're saying, how do, how do I fix this? So we're already increasing visibility of nuclear energy. And we're also increasing visibility of the marine industry. So incident in the canal during COVID, where you know we had a blockage of trade, everyone around the world suddenly realized how important these trade routes are and how important one ship is to deliver your everyday good and needs. So I think globalization, we're sharing this with our young education students, even from a very young age, they're aware of the marine industry and they're aware of the nuclear industry, that, th that we need them to help. I'm afraid to use the word again, but I but I have to mention uh, uh, all this will, will uh, certainly require uh, a regulatory framework and and revisions of of current regulations. Uh, certainly, uh, nuclear powered ships, for example, are not welcome in every port. Um, you know, so I guess uh, you know what what needs what reform needs to be done in that area, and what regulations need to be uh, put in place. Yeah, so you want to talk about regulatory opportunities, don't you, John? <laughs> so we have a lot of opportunity here. <laughs> I know Meg will want to talk about some of the uh, licensing connections, so I'll leave that for her. But as I think about what are some of the solution sets here, um, something that has already emerged in the industry, uh, something called green corridors. These today are very focused on making sure that green fuels are available to ships that are traveling between two ports. So if it's a, an ammonia port, a methanol port, that they can bunker between those two sites. Uh, I think there is a very real corollary here. When you think about licensing a reactor and, a, and putting it aboard a vessel that will transit between two ports, the nations that will receive those, those ships will need to have a level of agreement, especially for commercial or vice military. Um, where um, where the receiving nation or the receiving state understands where the reactor is coming from, its um, licensing regime, and it uh, it agrees to receive that. And those those types of agreements will need to be set up probably in advance of even some of the um, the construction of some of these vessels. So I think that green corridor opportunity presents a lot of um, optimism for uh, for the industry and in being able to solve this problem. Yeah, the benefits potential benefits is the opposite of opportunity. The outcome for us is is ideally we're looking for uh, ships that can operate wherever we want them to, ben you know, benefiting the trade wherever they go. But we still need to make sure that they're licensed and regulated appropriately, that you're addressing public risk concerns and that they're aware of it. Sometimes those are two different things. So I'm seeing from a licensing perspective and a marine classification and certification perspective, there hasn't been a lot of conversation in these areas in the past where we're trying to marry nuclear and maritime regulators. They don't conventionally talk to each other. 
So a lot of the challenges are just getting that relationship formed between different regulators, understanding how each other works and how we will potentially be working together. So I'm seeing likely that the advanced reactors of the future will still be licensed by the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission if it's a U.S. flying vessel. Every nation, every nuclear nation should have a licensing commission that will be operating in this role. And the class societies will continue to class the ship and maritime platforms of which that industry is installed on. Whether it be a nuclear barge or a ship, we don't necessarily want to overlap too much with what we know that the NRC and nuclear licensors are already doing. They need to know where we draw our, our regulatory boundaries, where they draw their regulatory boundaries. And that's a challenge because it's, it depends on the ships or the unit, and it also depends on each kind of reactor design specifically. Right. So certainly decarbonization has created a lot of opportunities for collaboration, and, and this seems like uh, yet another point where, as you mentioned, uh, nuclear uh, regulatory bodies have to uh, find out uh, what maritime regulatory bodies are, are doing and where the boundaries are and, and collaborate together. Yeah, I think something we say at ABS, uh, success is a team sport. And I think uh, in, in this case, it's uh, true more than ever. Not only from the regulatory perspective, but we also need our engineers to talk to our nuclear engineers, our marine. And so it's a, I'm seeing it as like a quad, a quadular problem. We need the engineers to talk to each other and the nuclear and the maritime regulators to talk to each other and everyone all together. So where it used to be a binary kind of discussion, we're having three, four, five agencies or departments that need to get together. And that's a big administrative challenge, among other things. Patrick, I was wondering, I, I guess, what is what is ABS doing in the uh, nuclear power uh, sector? Yeah, it's, um, you know, when uh, when I joined ABS in 2019, I asked some of my peers, you know, what what is the company's attitude, perspective? What do we do about nuclear energy? And, and I got a lot of strange looks um, and, and a lot of things have changed, right, in, uh, in, in those five years. Right now, we've got uh, lots of different projects going on uh, that you've read about in the press, certainly. We have uh, approvals in principle for concepts for power barges. We're doing joint development projects with ship owning clients that want to learn more about the industry. And I think one of the things that made some news is that we are investing in a design firm to produce nuclear powered concepts that we can start to use to base our own understanding, research development, and development of our own rules. And I think what that has done is it's really started to foster that communication that Meg was talking about, bringing some of the reactor design communities together with those maritime designers. And then we share this information uh, with some of the ship owners to really understand what are the practical challenges, limitations, what are some of the economic opportunities that are before us. If you don't have to bunker, if you have increased speed, what are some of the trade studies that need to be done in and around transiting payload fraction? It was interesting in one of our recent studies, I found that uh, I expected that we would lose the ability to carry payload because of the additional machinery, shielding, and things associated with a nuclear ship. And it turned out with the data that was provided by the designer, we had an increase in payload fraction because of the reduction in tankage aboard that particular ship design. In that case, it was a, it was a container carrier. And uh, we saw a single digit, but large percentage increase, um, relatively speaking, in the amount of containers that could be carried. So lots of economic opportunity that needs to be understood as well. And of course, what ABS's mission is all about, of course, is understanding the safety, understanding the risk implications. And using these types of studies, these type of collaborations to really frame what we need to go do as a class society to understand how this technology impacts marine safety. Yeah, the Herbert studies are really important because they may not be the right solution and that's okay. It's, it's not going to be the perfect ship. It's concept design. We need to get this on paper and understand what are the first takes of operational risk, of technological risk. And, and I love to have the conversation around those designs because people ask difficult questions. Yeah, it's not really the right design. Maybe that's not where we want to put the reactor. Maybe that's not the right kind of arrangement. But that's the right kind of discussion is, is I want to see optimization. I want people to ask the hard questions because we need to refine the, the concept designs of, of these arrangements. Uh, with a, a few minutes left in the, in the podcast, I, I want, wanted to both... Um... You both to have an opportunity to uh, provide your outlook on, on nuclear power in, in the maritime industry. And I guess, uh, Meg, 
Uh, why don't you kick us off? Yeah. And thanks for the opportunity to join today, John. I appreciate it. I'm seeing a lot of optimism behind many types of advanced reactor designs right now. Whether or not they are on a ship in the future, I'm going to be seeing nuclear reactor technology supporting the, the entire future of decarbonization, not only for maritime, but for the land. So if we can decarbonize our grid, we will be affecting those electric ships that need to use a shore connection. We'll be providing ready power for synthetic alternative fuel producers. And we'll also be providing a great solution for large vessels that have a really hard time figuring out what the solution is. So my outlook is very positive and I'm seeing a lot of people come together and a lot of conversations happening, which is really energizing. How about you, Patrick? Yeah. So how do, how do we describe the, the outlook? So I, like Meg, am, am very optimistic for this particular technology set. I do think we have a lot of work to do, right? There's um, technical challenges, there are regulatory challenges, there are economic challenges, there are licensing challenges. What I look for is uh, I would expect to see the first use of nuclear power in the maritime domain to be related to fuel production and or power barges that are not transiting between nations or between ports. I think that will happen first. And then the first types of ships that you will see under nuclear power for commercial work, commercial application, probably be a non-military government-owned type plant to really start to understand what that'll look like. So I think that's just kind of my perspective or my outlook on it. Uh, when I think about kind of the, the the overall impact of the industry, I still think the future is very, very bright. I think we've got lots of interesting technologies and opportunity that are going to get us to those very aggressive targets for decarbonization, for shipping, and, and for a maritime. And uh, I, I couldn't be more excited about the future. Thank you both for taking the time out and, and speaking with me today. Thank you, John. I, I really did appreciate the uh the time and the topic. Yeah, very exciting for the opportunities moving forward. Thanks, John. Thank you for joining us today on Setting Course, an ABS podcast. If you're interested in learning more about today's topic or listening to more episodes, visit www.eagle.org.